All right, it's 702. We'll go ahead and get started. Hello, my name is Xavier Duran. I am the adult programming coordinator for the Lyle Library District. A couple of things before we begin. Our presentation is in a webinar styled format, meaning only my pre only the presenter and myself have an active have an active camera and an active microphone. So you're more than welcome to chow down on uh, your pretzels with uh, cheddar cheese, make a mess. Uh, no one will see you on on the on the camera. Uh, second thing, if you have, because of the webinar style format, the only way that you'll be able to interact with us is through the Q&A feature. So if you have any questions, feel free to plop those in the Q&A section um, of the webinar. We will answer questions uh, during the program. I'll, I'll go ahead and flag down our presenter. Uh, one last thing, we have our summer read program going on right now. It began June 5th and it goes all the way through August 14th. When you read four books, you get a wonderful LLD picnic blanket. So if you're going to Ravinia or some other outdoor concert or just having a meal uh, outside um, in the beautiful uh, foliage and wonderful greenery, you're more than welcome to uh, read those four books and collect your prize. And that goes until August 14th. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera and hand it off to our Illinois Master Gardener. Hey, good evening, everybody. And thank you very much for spending some time with us tonight. Um, my name is Pat Kosmak. I am a Master Gardener with the University of Illinois Extension. Extension is the outreach arm from U of I itself directly into your communities. Master Gardeners are volunteers who take about 70 hours of training and give back 60 hours of time to their communities to earn the title Master Gardener. Um, after that, it is uh, 10 hours of that a year and 30 hours of time each year to keep the title. I've, uh, I am currently in my 21st year with the program. Um, a lot of us do a lot more hours than uh, what's required and we just love the program, the people we get to work with. Um, gives me a chance to be here and talk to all of you. So with that said, our program tonight is actually in two parts. The first part is how to kill your tree. Um, we'll talk about some things not to do. And the second part is uh, things to look for so that you can diagnose possible problems with your trees. So with that said, I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint here. And I need to share my screen. Share screen. There we go. And let's start the slideshow here. And here we go. I hope. There we go. All right. How not to kill your tree, a guide of what not to do. Um, we love our trees. Um, sometimes they come with the house. Sometimes they are, we plant them after we've moved in. Sometimes they are, we plant them in remembrance of people or occasions or that type of thing. But we can love our trees to death. So assess the situation before you plant. Taking a look here, you'll see where the tree was. Um, the tree was not going to live here. There's no soil for it to grow in. It, there's no place for the roots. Um, and there's no place for it really to get big and grow to its proper form. Um, assess your site when you're planting a tree. Um, is it very, is your site very wet? Is it at the bottom of a downspout or is it dry? Is there no, nothing other than rain nearby? Um, certain trees get plant, just like other plants, um, get plant, need to get be planted in a proper location. Um, some trees like it wet, some trees like it drier. Um, soil. Some, again, some trees like different soil uh, conditions. Um, some like a very loose um, hummus rich type soil. And there are soils that actually, there are trees that actually do grow better in our soils here in DuPage County with uh, our clay content and that type of thing. Um, wind 
Is it out in the middle of nowhere? This is a picture of a tree um, in a wide open area with constant wind. It's not going to stand up. The wind's going to keep blowing it. And that's the direction it's going to grow in rather than growing up. Light. What you're seeing here are two different dogwood plants. Um, some trees like to be planted in what we call the understory, which is underneath taller trees. And some trees are the upper story, which are the taller trees. Um, a dog, this is a dogwood. On the left side, you'll see one planted underneath uh, some taller trees and it will grow, but it won't give you the flowers and uh, other flowers and grow to its fullest extent without the sun that it needs because this is a full sun tree. So that's what we wanted to show you here. Um, space. How uh, take a look when you're buying a tree or any other plant for that matter. Take a look at the tag that comes with it. It will let you know um, how far, how tall the plant's going to get, how far apart they should be planted for uh, proper care and air circulation around them. Um, both of these trees are planted way too close to each other. They're going to compete for nutrients as well as water and other things. Before planting, always make sure to look up. Um, the one on the left was uh, pruned because of the lines and we've all driven down streets where we've seen trees um, kind of, you know, halfway with the lines running through them because ComEd has come in and had their people prune them. Um, the tree, this isn't going to help the tree. It's not good for the tree. And perhaps you should choose a different tree. Um, on the right side, you see one that got planted too close to the house and it, you know, the tree wins because it's going to grow that way. Um, also look down, look at what's down, look at what's underneath. Um, is there adequate soil volume for the tree? Um, on the left, we've got one that's got all paper blocking and sidewalks and no place for the roots to grow and get oxygen from. Same thing on the right, is that maple tree that's planted in that little box ever going to reach its full potential or is it gonna kind of hang on for a couple of years and die because the roots have no place to go? Um, space, here's some examples of poor planting choices. Um, on the left, you see them as their little babies and then on the right, you'll see them as they're starting to grow into their full uh, growth. Um, again, neighbor, uh, lots of neighborhoods, mine especially here. I'm in Addison, so I'm not in Lyle. But in our neighborhood, we've got a lot of people who have 30 plus year old fir trees that had, you know, looked uh, that were probably four feet, five feet when they were planted, but now they're 30 feet and they've taken over the house and the whole yard, just like the one you see on the top right there. So take into account how much space the tree is going to need when you're planting it. Um, plant higher, you don't wanna plant deeply. Um, on the right, you'll see a little picture there um, showing you the uh, right way to plant it. Um, we'll show you some pictures in a few minutes of incorrect planting. On the left, you've got one that's planted too deep, same as in the center there. Um, what you want is to be able to see the root flare. And that's the part where the topmost root comes from the trunk of the plant and leads out. It needs oxygen and um, you should be able to see this when you plant it. A lot of times we get trees that are planted too deep and uh, that's really bad for them. Um, constrictor, wire cage and twine must be removed. Um, we've got uh, trees are generally sold, bald and burlapped. You'll see a metal cage there around it. Um, we wanna remove the burlap because while it does degrade, it takes years and years and years because that's what you see on the right is uh, some synthetic material. Sugar maple, this is 10 years after planting and that material is still there on the tree. And if you take a look, the roots have not grown properly and that's not going to be a healthy tree. When you get your plant, one of the things you want to do, and you want to do this, um, say if you've got annuals, uh, petunias or uh, impatiens, you want to do this with their plants too. What happens is they grow uh, in the pot, 
The roots will grow around the pot, of course, because they're in the pot and contained rather than growing out in the ground and away from the plant to reach the nutrients. So what we want to do is we want to slash the roots and uh, make sure that they grow out as opposed to growing around each other because if it circles it, um, it, w it can kill the plant. It'll, it'll constrict the plant. Um, you know, and the other thing too is make sure you do this deep enough. My neighbor bought a Japanese maple, beautiful tree, and uh, it was all root bound. It, it, it was really, really bad, uh, much worse than the picture you see on the right here. And we started going in and we went, must have gone into the root ball about four inches before we actually found the metal cage that had been put there by the uh, growers to hold the root ball together. So we had to take that out too. So you want to go in an inch, two inches, even three inches deep, depending on how big the root ball is and make sure that the, that you cut into it, the roots are coming out and not circling the plant. This way it might, you know, look a little icky for a, a week or two, but what'll happen is instead of the roots circling the plant, the roots will go out through the ground and uh, reach out for the nutrients and water that it needs. Um, we don't necessarily want to mend the soil. Um, when we're planting a tree, we want to fill it with the soil that, that you took out of the hole. Because if you amend the soil, you put all kinds of compost and stuff in there, the roots will really like where it is and they won't grow out again wide enough to get enough nutrients and water and uh, actually anchor the tree. So, and if you look here, look on the right too, you'll see that the roots are curling kind of around the plant. And we do want to cut those off to make sure that uh, it doesn't uh, constrict the plant. Um, improper watering is another thing that we do that we don't do. Um, too much water on the right. If you look on the left, that tree, if you, the leaves, um, they're desiccated because they haven't gotten enough water. Um, you know, those little milk jugs or that, you know, when the tr city plants one on your parkway, they put that little green bag on there and the bag empties and then it doesn't get uh, filled again. So we want to uh, make sure that the tree does get enough water and we will probably talk, we talk about that next time. But the correct way really to water a tree is to take your hose out and just trickle for an hour or two. We don't want to put uh, too much water on too soon because then the water doesn't get absorbed into the ground and get to the roots where it's needed. It'll just either stay on top or it will uh, flow off. Um, place a hose on low. Just uh, we want to water the roots. We don't want to water the trunk and we want to uh, let the soil dry a bit between waterings. Again, this is uh, for healthy roots on your plant. Mulching, applying too mulch or incorrectly mulching is another stressor to the trees. If you take a look at this picture here, um, thinking about what mulch does. Mulch is, uh, for the most part, we use uh, tree, bar tree bark or uh, ground, ground up trees or whatever we can get. It's usually wood. And if you look, you can see towards the bottom there where uh, that kind of sawdusty material is. That's actually where the root flare on the tree is. And this is the part of the tree that should be at ground level. Um, looking at this, you can see the mulch. Um, you know, what does it do? We want it to uh, moderate the soil temperature. We want it to help keep in water. We want it to help cut down on weeds. But it does decay over time. And if you see, you've got that uh, wet mulch and that wet mulch goes up onto the bark of the tree and that uh, can destroy your trees. I mean, uh, the mulch doesn't know that it's mulch, uh, that it's any different from the bark of your tree. So what we wanna do is keep the mulch away from the uh, plant here. We don't want the mound like we have on the right. I mean, that's piled up, you know, like two feet there. And that's going to destroy two feet of the trunk. It, what el it also gives a home to all sorts of critters that live in there, which will uh, stay over the winter because it's a little bit warmer than the snow outside. And they'll eat the bark as well as uh, the mulch decaying the mark, the uh, tree bark.
Um, on the left, you'll see a picture of a tree. It's got the, it, it's planted at the proper depth, but it's also got the mulch pulled away from the trunk of the tree. We want to think bagel as opposed to mound of mulch around your trees. And this goes for other plants too. You want to try and keep it away from the uh, stems of your plants. Just a couple of inches is fine. And that will provide the protection that, and uh, uh, water holding capabilities that you want. Um, one of the things we don't want to do is top our trees like this. Um, bad haircut ruins your day. Bad pruning can give it an unsightly appearance. Um, it puts stress on the plant. Um, you know, you take a look at the trees in the background there that weren't topped off. You'll see how they're green. They've got all their leaves on them and the leaves are photosynthesizing. Top the tree off and um, it, will get, it will grow some weak growth up on the top. But this really is not good to your tree. You've got the open wounds there and this can lead to disease or pest problems too. Um, again, topping your tree, I mean, you know, the power line there is okay and going to do fine, but take a look at those trees which have been topped off by probably the power company again um, and the really weak growth that you see going there. I see other problems, but we'll talk about that in the next presentation. Uh, talk a little bit about proper pruning because one of the things we need to do to keep our trees healthy is prune some of the wood off occasionally. Um, you might have a dead branch. You might have a branch that's growing across another branch, which is uh, rubbing the bark away from both branches. Um, we wanna first identify the branch collar, which is a part of the tree attached to the wood, uh, the widest part attached to the tree. And uh, this might sometimes be better off um, observed from the underneath it. Um, you can use loppers or hand pruners for smaller branches, still cutting at the branch collar. And for larger limbs, we want to make three cuts. Well, that's our next slide coming here. Um, this is a three cut technique here. You want to make the first cut maybe about a third of the way in, in front of the branch collar. The second cut, you're going to take part of the branch off. And the reason we don't cut it right at the branch collar there is because sometimes when we cut it right there, the weight of the branch will pull the uh, whole branch down and it'll take some of the bark and some of the in tissue underneath the bark off of the tree. So we make the first cut about a third of the way in. We make the second cut to cut the bulk of the branch off. And then we make the third cut to uh, just cut it right where it needs to go. And one of the things we do not need to do is seal this because if we do it right, um, if you cut at the branch collar, the branch collar will um, secrete um, uh, things that will seal it off. The tree will seal itself, so you really don't need to seal it for it. Other ways that we damage our trees here um, is with our lawnmowers. Um, drive down your block, you'll see trees that have kind of, you know, they may be older, they may be younger, they'll have kind of a round uh, wound sort of that's been sealed over, you know, on the bottom part of the tree. A lot of times that's from uh, driving our mowers into it. Um, this can girdle, this can also girdle the tree. It'll cut off, uh, it, you know, it cuts off the bark and stuff, and it also opens uh, the tree up to uh, any sort of pests and diseases that might be in the area. Um, let me go back a little bit here, talk for a second here. Another thing that we do with our mowers is that we drive over the branch, the uh, roots. Sometimes the roots, if the tree is planted incorrectly, the roots will reach up above the soil and they'll be wanting to get oxygen. So um, we go over those with our mowers. Please don't do that. Um, you can move around it. Um, also be careful with your string trimmers and stuff too. These can uh, cause uh, wounds that would act in the same way. Um, you know, a lot of times it's not the home, it, you know, it's the, this says it was a homeowner in their backyard with the poison, which killed this tree. What happens is that people don't realize is that the pesticides that you use on your lawns and stuff can affect your trees. Um, we should always read the labels um, to see if 
the pesticide is uh, safe for other plants and not, you know, just grass and stuff. Um, this is a label for this particular pesticide. Um, when we use pesticides for things that we call broadleaf uh, weeds, um, like dandelions and that type of thing, trees also have broad leaves. So if it affects things like dandelions and other things, it's possible for it to affect your trees. Um, if you look here, this, uh, this was an herbicide kill. Um, some of the herbicides that we use, not just, um, we put them on the soil. Um, sometimes if we, spray, if we spray them out when it's windy outside, um, the spray can drift into other plants and your trees, or the, or the particular pesticide could be soil borne and mobile in your soil, which would mean that not only would it go for the grass, but it would go for other broadleaf plants in the area too. They would suck it up through the soil. So when you decide to use an herbicide, please always read the label, know what you're using, and uh, how it affects other plants in the area. Um, again, read product labels. This is what happens when you don't read your product labels. Um, you can kill the lawn, you can kill the trees. Um, the plants in the background there don't look real healthy either. So again, one of the things we always stress, please read the label and do that every time you use the herbicide, just to refresh your memory and know what you're using. Um, this is an absent-minded homeowner here. Um, years ago, this guy uh, planted his tree. He put the, a tomato cage over it to uh, protect it from deer and then left it there. Well, what's going to happen with this? The tree eventually is going to keep growing and it's going to grow around that wire cage and the wire cage is going to eat into it and the tree will never reach its full potential. So take a look around, take this off if you, hit, you know, and make sure you get these out of there. So what's the correct and incorrect way to plant a tree? Um, we'll kind of look at the pictures here. Um, crossing branches not pruned, we talked about that. Um, the label left on the tree, um, that's usually on a plastic tag, which, can, which may rot away eventually, but uh, before it does, it'll probably eat into the uh, trunk of the tree. Um, flat, black plastic mulch. Um, organic mulch is great, but when you put the black plastic on, on there, um, underneath the mulch, around the base of the tree, that, help, that keeps water out and air out, and that's really not a good thing for your trees. Um, see another one, the wire basket's not there. You got a stake driven through the root ball so that uh, you can kind of uh, put, put the wires up and stake it and try and keep it straight. And uh, burlap's not removed. The plant, the plant can't grow roots. The roots won't grow through that for years until that uh, goes away. Correct way is to, you know, light pruning, just uh, as little as you have to. Um, if you feel it necessary uh, to uh, put a guard on it, like uh, tape it up or whatever, just do that for the winter so that your plants, so that uh, the plants don't get eaten by uh, other animals and please take it off in the spring. Um, Use only the existing soil. You want your hole to be two to three times uh, the root ball width and the depth the same as the root ball. Don't plant it too tight. That's the biggest mistake people plant, uh, make in planting trees is planting it too deep. And uh, all of the ropes are removed. As much of the burlap as you can get out of there um, is removed. And uh, this tree should do much better than the last one. Don't let this happen to your tree. Those holes are bad. Those holes you see may look cute here right now, but um, the bottom one was probably a lawnmower injury many years ago, and the top ones could perhaps be uh, uh, just poor pruning. So don't let this happen to your tree. Um, this ends this part of the program. So let me get out of this 
and we'll come back to this. Um, this I'll leave this up for a second and talk about this. Um, this is the uh, DuPage Extension office contact information. Um, one of the great things about our office is that we have a free helpline. So if you've got problems uh, with your trees, leaves don't look good, um, your tomato plant has bugs on it, or uh, you just want a suggestion perhaps of a pesticide to use if uh, it's necessary, uh, we'll identify bugs as well as diseases for you. So, and this is a free service to our community. Um, right now, the office, the uh, best way to get a hold of us would be to send a question via the email the address because uh, people aren't in the office every single day now, of course. And uh, we're just, we're trying to respect everybody and everything right now. So if you've got a question, please feel free to contact us. And this is the gentleman, Chris Enroth, who put this program together. He's one of our extension or horticulture educators, and he serves downstate here. So let's get out of this one. Does anybody have any questions about this part of the program? And you're more than welcome to put the questions in the Q&A yeah, feature. Do. And um, yeah, feel free to put them even during, during the presentation and we'll go ahead and answer them as they become available. Uh, one one question that I have is um, uh, planning uh, for trees and making sure it doesn't inter uh, interfere with potential plumbing or electrical. Right. How to go about that? That 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 is a great question. Um, yeah, know what's underground. You might want to call Julie, which is the uh, Joint Utilities Locating Information for Excavators. I believe it's eight one one, but I don't have that in front of me right now. Um, yeah, they'll come out for free and mark your, uh, under any underground lines that you have, um, gas lines, you don't want to get in the gas line, you don't want to cut into your neighbor's underground cable line or anything like that, but if you're planning on putting in a tree uh, that's going to get rather large, it would be a good idea to find out what's underground before you plant the tree. All right. Advice on saplings. Started as an acorn, raised bed, found stock in a year when it's three inches tall. Just take care of it. Um, is it getting enough sun? Um, how's it, how long ago was it? How's it looking now? Only been a few weeks. Just take care of it. Um, you know, keep the animals away from it if you can. If it's three inches, that's great. You've just got it started. It's going. Um, just make sure it's planted. It was planted properly, which you probably did do. And uh, just keep an eye on it. Protect it from uh, things that uh, like, uh, you know, pests and uh, animals. So see how it goes. It's probably got a good root system started so just keep your eye on it and hopefully it'll be fine for you all right let's move on here oh a couple questions in the chat um oh, what is the uh what is the best way to identify existing trees and foliage in your gar in your yard Oh my, there are so many different ways to do that. I, you know what, I take some pictures and uh, send them to that master gardener helpline. They'd be happy to help you. Um, you know, Morton Arboretum has a helpline also that's open to the public. So uh, take some trees, we'd be more than happy to do that for you. Um, identify, tree identification is not one of my strong points. Um, so, Please take some pictures, send it on in, and uh, we'd be happy to identify it for you. And another one is, uh, what major tree diseases should we be most watchful for in this area currently? Oh, my word. Well, we just got some rain, so I'd be, uh, it's been very dry. Um, there's not a lot that you probably haven't heard from at this point. Um, most things, a lot of things are fungal. So there's not a lot 
that we can do about it, especially if you've got a 30 foot, you know, tall maple tree or whatever, that's, uh, you know, got a bunch of spots on it. I mean, you're not going to be able to spray that. Most trees, when they get to that point, are pretty hardy and can send off minor infections and that type of thing pretty quickly, um, or at least within a season. A lot of times it's just, um, just a fungal type thing. Um, and again, send that into the office um, if you've got problems. Um, you'll see spots on your leaves and that type of thing. So take pictures, send it into the office, and we'd be happy to identify it for you. You know, it, it, it all depends on what kind of tree it is as to what diseases are around. Uh, another one, I have a young maple sapling about five feet high and five eighths of an inch diameter. Does it need to be staked? It's growing beautifully straight currently. If it's growing beautifully and straight, how long has it been in the ground? One year. One year. You don't need to stake it. It's doing great. If it's been in the ground for, it, you should only stake your trees if, you know, they're, they're in kind of, if they're not standing up straight or uh, they're, the soil is real loose and it's going to flop on over or something. After a year, it's anchored itself into the soil and you should be fine. Uh, another one. What's the best way to protect tree trunk from animals during summer? During summer, um, I would spray it with something that tastes bad. Or you can put a cage of some sort far enough away from the tree that it doesn't bother the trunk. Um, chicken wire, that type of thing. It's not necessarily aesthetically pleasing, but it will keep uh, most critters away. Um, I, I'd go with something that tastes bad first and see if that works quickly. Uh, Frequently, I mean, uh, if, if you're talking rabbits, um, that's a whole different thing than deer. And if it's deer, you probably want to keep it caged in, in some way, but make sure you keep the cage a couple inches away from the trunk so that it's got room to breathe as well as the trunk to grow. But as for something tasting bad, um, garlic, hot pepper, that type of thing would taste bad to the animals and hopefully they won't come back. Anything else for now? It looks like that's it. Cool, let's move on to the second part here. Let's see if I can get this other one up. And low tree health assessment. And look at the sharing again. Here. Well, there we go. Okay, sorry folks, there we go. Let's zoom share. Snapshot window is closed. Let's see, crab apple. See that while I'm figuring this out here. I'm sure crab apple has bloomed every spring. Leaves are spotted and fall off every summer. You could have tree, you've got to have um, the problem diagnosed to make sure that uh, you're using the right thing. Um, make sure it's apple scab and not something else. So when you see those again, and I'm guessing it's probably starting to come off, it's starting soon. Uh, take some pictures of the leaves or bring them into the office. We, uh, you know, can diagnose this that way too. Um, our office is located on roughly uh, Naperville Road and Warrenville Road in, Na in the north part of Naperville. So we, we do take samples in and we'll try and identify it for you. So let's um, take a look at that. All right. Um, Let's see here. Now I'm going to try and get this back up again. Tree health assessment. Okay, where is it? All 
All right. That looks, does that look good? That's on my screen. Is that on everybody else's? Uh, no. It no. looks like a, you're not sharing your screen at the moment. I am not sharing my screen here. All right. Let's see here. Beginning. Right, how does that go away? How's that now? Are we there? Yep, perfect. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, things to look for to assess the health of the trees that you already have. There's two major points of a tree's life that uh, we assess it from. Generally, it is uh, from five up to five years or over five years. So if you bought a house with trees, you're gonna to have to guess most likely it's more than five years. It's an older tree more than five years. So we'll talk about both here in a second. My notes here. Okay, your first step is always gonna be selecting the tree itself. If you're planting a new tree, a young tree, um, look at the natural shape of the tree. Make sure it looks healthy. No heading back or severe pruning. Um, a lot of times uh, nurseries will prune the trees. They'll head it back, which is cutting the top part of it off just to make it kind of look pretty and bushy. But that's going to cause the tree to put out uh, weak growth. Ideally, plants should be grown locally or climate similar to ours. You don't want uh, the tree that was grown, say, in uh, Florida. That's not going to survive here. We want something that's going to survive in our area, in our zone, and hopefully was grown in the general area here. Most of our uh, local nurseries have uh, their own nurseries, which um, are in the area here, and they grow the trees locally. So ask where the tree came from. Um, if you look here, we've got uh, two different trees. Um, you'll see the one on the right. It's got one leader, one, uh, one main trunk going up. You look at the, other, the one on the left, and it's got kind of two trunks there, and uh, they're growing kind of uh, from themselves. It, that We call it the crotch of the tree there. That's not healthy because what eventually happens is you see where those two, where that joins, uh, they're rubbing against each other. Not only that, but there's kind of an area in there that's going to hold water. It's going to hold uh, debris. It's going to allow bugs in. And eventually one part of those is going to fall, uh, come off because it's not healthy. So we want to look at our trees with one main branch stem coming up. Ah, okay, one job in a trunk, strong branch unions. And, you know, if you look at the canopy on the right side, it, it, it's kind of balanced there and kind of roundish. And if you look at the one on the left side, you can see where it was topped off there. And, and it just doesn't look healthy. You can see the new, the short growth up there. Um, here's a closer picture of uh, what we call co-dominant stems and bark inclusions. These are the more than one branch there you look on you know you can look and see how these trees they're several years old but you can see how that's unhealthy and how it's going to contribute to causing problems later um this has been topped off because the nursery thinks that uh you know uh people want to see the tree looking bushy and uh you know more have more leaves on it but you can't from this you can't even see whether it has just one stem this one, you go in there and you take a look and you'll see that it's got just the one main stem, but you'll also see there at the top that uh, there's kind of a, uh, you can see the uh, cut that was made when they pruned that. So you probably don't want something like that. These are some uh, planting options. Um, red maples are great trees. We've got lots of maples in the area. But uh, diverse groups of plants, I mean, 
one of the things you plant all the same tree, we've all heard about Dutch elm disease. We've all heard about emerald ash borers and the, those pests are all kind of, they, they glom onto one tree, one type of tree. And when you plant all the same trees in all the same area, in the same area, what's going to happen is they're all going to get uh, the same diseases or the same fungi or the same bugs, and they're all going to die at the same time. So one of the things we want to do is diversify the trees that we're planting. Um, here are some, uh, a few uh, things that go beyond the red maple. Um, serviceberry, it's a small tree. It's great for wildlife. Hackberry, no main, very low maintenance. It's got nice bark and fall color. Uh, beech, European beech, it's got a very smooth bark and there's a lot of cultivars out there. Again, take a look at the labels when you go to the nursery and read them. Look and see uh, how tall the tree's going to get and uh, what color it's going to be. They'll tell you that too. Um, ginkgo is another great uh, tree to have. However, um, it's got really interesting leaves, but you want to make sure you plant a male because the female will produce a very smelly type fruit. Kentucky coffee tree is a large tree. Um, I've got them around here in my neighborhood in Addison um, and uh, they're in the parkways. They're a nice tree. Witch hazel is a small tree with lots of interest. Uh, Liriodendron, tulip tree. It's a big, it's a big tree. This is the one that's out in front of my house that I had to actually ask the city to plant for me because we had seen them and they were just beautiful. Um, they've got beautiful leaves and a very unusual green and orange flower on them. And another uh, great tree to plant in our area is uh, black gum. It's a native and it has really pretty fall colors on it. Okay, planning process. Uh, the first 20 minutes of your tree in your yard is going to determine the rest of its life, really. Um, how you plant your tree is the most important thing probably you're ever going to do. Okay, we want to plant them again. We talked about planting at the proper depth. You look at both of these trees here. You look, at, um, you can see the flare, which is where it starts getting bigger. It's a little more noticeable on the right. You can see where the roots are growing out of the tree. And this is what we want. We want this part of the tree to be at or slightly above the uh, soil line because it, do, it uh, does need oxygen uh, in order to grow. Um, this one isn't going to go too far here. While you know, we talked about the one main leader, it has that, but this doesn't have adequate soil volume. There's no place for the roots to grow. Think about the roots going three, four, five times beyond what we call the drip line of the tree, which is where the leaves end. The leaves may end there, but the roots are gonna go out three, four, five times farther than that. And if you picture that with this tree, a couple of years, it, the roots are growing into that parking lot. So this is not the pro necessarily the proper tree for this place. You look there and uh, they dug down. Um, you'll see that uh, <laughs> several things wrong with this one. Um, first of all, you've got that uh, black mulch there, the black plastic mulch there, which is pulled out. You can see that uh, if you look farther down, I think that's my next picture. Yeah, here's my next picture. This is a little closer here. Um, you can see where, the, uh, where it was uh, planted too deep, um, which is where all that uh, uh, wetness is. And uh, you can see where uh, the roots are. So I wish I, I wish I was there so I could, you know, just kind of go up to the screen and point out these things to you. Okay, planting hole. You want the planting hole about 50 inches, 50% 50 wider than the root ball. Wider hole is better and you don't want to plant it any deeper than the existing root ball. In fact, you may have to uh, even bring that up a bit depending on whether or not that's buried the uh, root flare which is that bottom part of the tree we've been talking about. Okay, um, you know, here, here's a picture of many, many things gone wrong. You see those little green dots up there? That's how far it was planted into the pot. Um, the red line there is kind of a circling root and where the uh, uh, dampness is setting in. That orange line is where it should have been planted. You'll see the roots starting to come up there. Um, 
you know, setting it deeper into the soil exposes it to these problems and plant this in a shallow hole um, so that it doesn't settle. Because when you put it in there and you put the soil in, it, it's going to sink a little bit. So you want to make sure that it's at the plant planting uh, at the proper planting level. Remove the burlap. Uh, the gentleman here in this picture is holding a burlap that was planted 13 years ago. So while yes, it may eventually uh, decay, it's going to take a long time and that is going to cause problems with the tree roots. Remove the wire cages. Talk to you about my neighbor's tree. This is what we found inside the root ball was a wire cage like this. So make sure that there's no wire cage that you're planting there because that's going to uh, keep the roots from growing too. Okay, after it's planted, you've planted it properly. Mulch it. Um, apply the mulch. You want mulch generally, and this goes for uh, your annuals and perennials in your garden too, two to four inches deep. And you want it wider than the planting hole. Keep it away from the main stem of the plant because as you just saw in the last picture, you know, all that can decay. You're planting wood and mulch. And if you put it up against the wood of your tree, that's going to deteriorate too. So think bagel when you're planting the trees, not muffin. Again, no volcanoes. That's one of the, uh, the one on the left is a typical tree there. One on the right um, is just too deep to uh, the plant. It was probably planted too deep, held too much water and uh, it just rotted away. Organic mulches are best. They reduce evaporation. Uh, Weed growth, um, they give you, uh, they help keep water in the soil. Um, they produce, they decay and produce good soil and they promote, promote good root growth and good trunk growth provided it's kept away from the trunk. Um, inorganic mulches such as plastic um, is gonna cause you a problem because water and nutrients can't get into the soil. Um, if you wanna use say rocks, that's not going to add anything to the soil. Uh, that's not going to add organic matter to the soil, such as uh, wood chips and that type of thing would. So think about using org organic mulch. Um, wrapping. Somebody had asked about wrapping. Um, you want to prevent sun scald, insect damage, and rodent damage. And it's more important for thin bark species uh, as opposed to uh, something like a maple that's got that kind of corky type bark. Um, you'll put this up in late fall, but remove it before it starts growing in the spring. Um, types of things you can use, crepe paper, spiral plastic, hardware cloth, anything that breathes so that you're not holding um, moisture up against the trunk itself. Um, we had a, uh, we, our tree out in uh, the parkway again, we'll go back to that one. Um, my cats were uh, using it and to, they were marking it with their claws. They were scratching it. So we finally put up a piece of uh, underground uh, piping that's got uh, some uh, underground plastic piping that's got some uh, drainage holes in it. And uh, we took that down, of course, in the spring, but that kept, it kept them away from it. But it did have uh, holes in it so that uh, the trunk didn't get wet and stay wet and decay. Um, staking and drying. You want to do this um, if it's windy outside. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, you protect from mowers and that type of thing. Um, don't stake un unless it's necessary. If the tree's planted properly, it's not leaning over, it's in a good site, it doesn't need to necessarily be staked. And you want to remove it after one season of growth. You don't want to leave it much longer because then the tree the tree's going to rely on it. It won't grow the roots. It won't uh, get as strong as it could. So we take a look at this tree, this tree here. Um, those wires have been on this tree for probably 15 years. You'll notice there's very little trunk to it. And the moment they removed, the, they removed these wires, the tree fell over. So again, just a year, just a, season, a growth season or so. You don't need to uh, stake your trees any longer than that. Watering. Um, watering is the number one cause of transplant failure. First two years are an established period. Um, Generally, all of our plants need about an inch of water a week. And if Mother Nature does not provide that, we want to provide it for them. 
Um, you want to water the entire depth of the root zone, dripple, trickle, ignition, uh, irrigation. Um, going back to my tree out in front, um, this was planted in 2012, which is when we had the last really, really bad drought. Um, we haul the hose out there every week and dripped irrigation to it. And it's just a beautiful tree now, a few years later. Um, and you want to water the entire depth of the roof zone. We want to triple trickle it because if you just take a hose and go out there and spray it around, um, it's going to run right off. So if you take it, take the hose out for an you know, hour or so, move it every 20 minutes or so, and get the whole root zone. You know, which is uh, generally, you know, at two, three times the uh, drip zone of the tree. And again, the drip zone is where the uh, leaves end. Pay special attention to watering and establishing um, if they're less than five years old during droughts. And again, know your species. Some tree species need more water than others. And uh, those little green plastic bags, those are the ones the city will put out there for you. But those are going to have to be filled again and filled again because the city's you know, a tree will use that in a week. City's going to come out maybe once a month, once every six weeks or so when they think about it. So make sure you water your trees. Um, 2012, hottest year on record. Um, this, uh, we're talking about the drought. So um, again, water your trees during times of drought. And it has, we have had a drought here in the area. We're still a few inches uh, under what normal precipitation would be. However, after the other night, um, we're, I mean, the tree got enough water for the week. So uh, you may not need to water it this week, but uh, depending on what happens next week, you might need to water it next week. Um, what does drought do to our trees? It slows the growth, um, makes them more susceptible to insects and diseases. Um, parts of the trees can die. It stunts next year's growth. And uh, new, plant, uh, new plantings, the conifers can, you know, will die if they go into the winter with drought stress. Um, if we don't get enough water in the ground in the fall, it, it becomes a drought because our plants um, consider winter a drought. They see winter as a drought because the ground's frozen. They can't um, take up nutrients and water as they normally would. So um, if you're planting in fall, and fall is a great time for planting, just make sure your plants get at least an inch of water a week, one way or another. And that evaluating established trees, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, now we're talking about trees that have been here more than five years or so. Okay, one of the things to look for is dead wood. And we may not see the dead branches. If uh, we've got a tree that's got, uh, you know, some great growth, there may be dead branches up there someplace in the canopy and we may not see it. Um, missing bark can be an easy giveaway. Any branch longer than four feet in length or more than two inches in diameter is considered dangerous. Um, you know, think about how big that is and if that falls on your head from 15, 20 feet. Um, broken and hanging branches should be removed. And uh, most of these should probably be addressed by a certified arborist which is uh, somebody who has been specially trained in trees. Um, the outward signs, what do you look for? Signs of rot, decay, structural weakness. You know, a lot of the trees, if you look at a lot, a lot of the trees that came down the other day, um, you'll see a lot of them have brown and what looks like decaying material inside. That indicates that they're weak and uh, that they weren't growing properly and that they haven't been growing properly for a while. And that can cause problems. Um, fungal fruiting bottles, uh, shell, shelf uh, fungus are, are a common sign that uh, something inside the tree is uh, compromised um, because what you see on the outside is not what's on the inside. What's on the inside is eating up and decaying the trees. Um, if you see hollows or cavi cavities, that can be a sign of a structural weakness. Once 40% of the structure is rusted, lost, the tree is in danger of falling down. You might see splits. Um, again, that co, you know, two stems coming out with the, with the crotch there. 
um, splits, cracks, lightning scars. You might even see scars from lightning. And again, these should probably be evaluated by a certified arborist who knows trees and knows what they're doing and how to take care, how to take them down properly. Another place to assess is the root zone. You know, assess the canopy, take a look at the canopy. We've looked at the canopy. We've looked for dead branches. Um, we've looked for falling bark. Um, take a look at the root zone and what you can see above the ground. Tr remember tree roots spend three, three to five times the canopy. Um, what's happening in the root zone nearby? Um, have we used uh, pesticides that we shouldn't have used that it sucked up? Um, are there girdling roots? If you look at this tree, you can see the girdling roots around it, the roots growing around it. And, and one of the things that amazed me is finding out the trees in an urban setting have, have an average lifespan of only eight years. So that, that to me was pretty amazing. Um, start at the base of the tree, look to see if the root flare is visible. Take a look and see if, uh, you know, these roots you see here are above ground. You run over that with your lawnmower and that's going to cause damage and it's, it's going to leave openings for bugs and that type of thing. Leaf size and color. Um, this is a catalpa tree. And uh, again, know your tree. Um, is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it environmental stress? Um, are, are, are we over or underwatering it? Um, this is a catalpa, and those leaves look kind of yellowish green, but this is normal for this tree. It's not necessarily normal for a maple or an oak, but for this tree, it is normal. So know your tree and uh, what it's supposed to look like. There's some great information out there on the internet. Um, and just keep an eye. Uh, there's some great information out there. Just go to reliable sources. Okay, and annual growth. How much is it growing? How much should it grow? Um, the terminal bud scar that we see here is where the tree stopped growing last year and went into dormancy and then started growing again this year. How much should your tree be growing a year is what, this, what we're getting at here. And if you look here, that's another picture of the terminal bud scar and you can see this fairly easily on your trees because uh, it's there. I wish I... Yeah. Let's see, can I get my mouse here? Yeah, here. So there's a past growth. And this is where it started growing in the current year, whatever the current year was for this picture. But know what your tree's annual growth rate is. Um, trunk growth. Lichens as indica can be indicators. Um, they don't cause your tree any problem per se. They don't impact the growth, but they can indicate stress. If you look at the bottom of this picture, look at that root. And that's the way that root is circling all around that tree there. And, uh, you know, that's going to stress the tree. Again, lichens aren't going to stress it, but that girdling root that you see at the bottom is. Competition with other plants. Trees, their roots are in the top, you know, foot or so of the, gr of, uh, the ground. Um, one of their biggest competitors is turf grass. Um, they did a study at uh, Morton Arboretum. They removed uh, the lawn around the tree, uh, you know, three times that drip line. The, tr the root mass increased by 195%. So take a look. Um, you'll, so that's pretty amazing in and of itself. Um, again, the biggest competitor is turf grass. Grass's roots go down six inches. And so that's competing with uh, your trees for uh, nutrients as well as water. And we're getting to the end here, folks. Um, signs of pests. Pests can often be a secondary cause to the problem. Um, is your problem abiotic, such as drought stress, which is what we're looking at on the left here? Or is, is it biotic? Is it a biological problem, uh, bur oak blight? is uh, been identified on this particular plant on the right. There is a lot of other diseases, of course, but that's just the particular one for this. Um, is it something uh, like drought stress or is it a bug or a fungus or a disease that's causing your tree problem? And these are just credits for the pictures and putting this whole uh, thing together. Um, some of our uh, educators here in the state of Illinois. And again, 
I'll point out our uh, our office contact information for uh, the Master Gardener office here in DuPage County. We're on Morinville Road. Um, if you've got questions, problems with your plants, again, please give us a call. We'd be happy to help you out. And again, it's a free service. Um, do note though, that if you send it in, um, we're still, I, we do have people in the office answering questions a couple of days a week at this point, but uh, it might take a day or two to get back to you. So please be patient, at, but we are more than happy to help you. And uh, we've got people who specialize in every aspect of gardening here. While my particular passions happen to be annuals, perennials, uh, water plants, um, and that type of thing, and seed growing, um, we have people who answer questions about roses, can identify your trees, and uh, have would be able to look up more specific information from the resources that they have in the office. So with that said, again, back to our friend Chris Enroth here. Um, one more thing, questions. I sent you a couple, um, I did send out, uh, send to Xavier a uh, couple of uh, handouts for you. One was for each presentation, uh, talking about trees and some of the problems and what to look for. And the third one is on a new invasive pest. Well, it's not exactly new. It's been here. It's been identified in DuPage County since 2015 called uh, jumping worms. And uh, please take a look at that, follow the precautions. And uh, we just want to make sure that uh, everybody's aware of this one. So with that said, thank you very much for having me. Are there any more questions? that I might be able to answer for you. And just a heads up, um, I, I emailed uh, the sheets to the participants. Uh, the sheets are also available on the on our, our calendar as well um, by the Zoom link um, and it, you should be able to download. If not, uh, feel free to email me. Oh, one question. Could you repeat the name of the new disease? Uh, well, it's not a disease. It's actually a pest. They're called jumping worms. And just like most of the other things that we've had uh, come through here, they come from Asia. They are worms very similar to the earthworms that we find here. Um, there's information on there as to how to identify them. But one of the uh, best ways to identify if you find them they will move very differently than you're used to seeing worms move. Also, there's a white band around the center that's called the clitellum that's um, more prominent on these. The other thing too is um, the problem with them is that our, our earthworms that we find here, which came over from other places, but the earthworms we find here are good for our soil. They dig in our soil, they dig down deep into the soil, they uh, bring oxygen and water down to plant roots, their castings um, fertilize the soil. With jumping worms, um, they, you'll see their castings on top of the ground. They look like coffee grounds. Um, they keep water and nutrients from reaching the plant roots. And you'll find these in the first uh, under the leaf litter layer and in the first inch or two of soil as opposed to far deeper. The problem with them is that they do lay, uh, they do lay cocoons like our general earthworms do. But while the adults of the jumping worm are killed over the winter, the, the eggs, the uh, cocoons last through the winter. So you'll have a whole new generation next year just waiting to come back up. So please, please read uh, the uh, uh, handout that's sent to you. Um, currently at this point, there's a lot of uh, research being done, but there is no solution. Um, heat has been tried, but um, there is no recommended solution to get rid of these things at this point. So um, again, please just read it. Thank you. And one more question. Uh, do you come out to the property in Lyle to inspect trees? 
No, we do not. No, we do not. We do not come out to uh, anybody's property. It's kind of a liability type thing as we're volunteers uh, with the U of I. So um, if you wanted to have a tree assessed, I get a hold of a certified arborist and have that person uh, assess the tree for you. Unless of course it's on your parkway. If it's on your parkway, give your village a call and talk to whomever uh, handle, handles the parkway trees. Uh, the village, pro your village probably has an arborist on staff to take a look at those things. So. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much for the information and also the heads up on uh, the jumping worm. Um, this uh, presentation should be available on YouTube soon. Uh, Pat, thank you so much for, um, for joining us this evening. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been my pleasure to speak with you and your patrons this evening. And um, I'll be back again. I, I think I'll be back again in August. I, I believe we were talking about uh, plants that uh, bloom in late summer and fall. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you again very much for having me. It's been my pleasure. And I look forward to speaking with all of you again soon. Hope you have a good evening. And thank you so much for being here tonight.